where would you like me to start? <laughs> well, can you tell me about coming over to the States from, from, from Germany? Not, not a lot to tell. I was uh, 12 years old. It was an uneventful trip. We, uh, my father was already here. He was, had been threatened with uh, internment. And uh, his uh, boss, he, he worked for a large chemical company in Berlin. Um, and his boss was kind enough to not only warn him, but arrange for him to work at the, uh, the, they, the company had a sales office in New York, no laboratory. And uh, the idea was that he would establish a research lab. It's a sharing corporation, which is you know, still going strong. And, and uh, he started with, uh, with nothing. He rented a loft kind of place in Bloomfield, New Jersey. Um, because it had been a printing shop, and so they had utilities laid on that they needed. And uh, so we moved to Montclair and lived there until I, I lived there until I went to college. My parents lived there much longer. Um, and he built up the research lab. But uh, he left Germany. Uh, very quickly, and my mother and I stayed behind. And she was ill at the time, and uh, it was, uh, I'm sure, a very hard period for her. She was trying to get permission, which was still possible in 1933, uh, to take money out. She didn't get it all, but she got. Uh, all she could, <laughs> and uh, we, one night we were already packed, ready to move, you know, those days they had wooden crates, and uh, one night the doorbell rang, and it was two stormtroopers, mm. and that was pretty scary, but they were quite polite. Uh, they did unpack everything that was packed. It wasn't at all clear what they were looking for, but the likelihood is that they were looking for uh, patent literature. That my, my father held a lot of patents, and uh, I think that's what they were probably after. They, you know, didn't take anything. They were perfectly, uh, reasonably polite. It was pretty scary. Um, but anyway, my mother and I got off about three months after my father. And um, it was a real culture shock. <laughs> my mother spoke no English. My father just wasn't very good. And I had had sort of crash lessons that summer. But... Uh, I really, you know, didn't know much. But in in Europe, you you grew up certainly then and probably now with the idea that learning another language was a perfectly normal thing to do. Uh, my mother had grown up in Russia and spoke Russian and Polish and German, and uh, uh, my father didn't. I mean, he spoke some French and some English, but uh, he wasn't at that time terribly fluent in any of them. How old were you at this time? I was twelve, oh. and I I had been we had French lessons in school from fifth grade on. So I, I was actually much better at French than English at that point. Uh, but I was, you know, got to be my mother's spokesperson because she really had not a single word, and, and she didn't want to learn. She was very resistant to the whole thing. 
She was sure the whole Nazi business would blow over and we should have stayed there. She loved Berlin. What area of Berlin were you living in? Um, what area Berlin? Were you? Yeah. In West End. Um, do you know Berlin? Yeah. Uh, do you know Reichstrasse? It's, it's on, uh, it was really at the very edge of the city then. Um, and it was just empty country between us and Spando. Uh, you could see Spando across the sandy wastes. Spando is still very green. Very was, what? Very green. I was there last year at this time. Oh. And it's still very foresty. Uh, <laughs> And, I don't uh, think I was ever in Spando. <laughs> you 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 take the you take the the U Bahn or the S Bahn. Yeah, I forgot which one to, well, to Spando. We were at the end of the U Bahn. <laughs> well, they still have it where it goes past Spando now, but when you get off at Spando to actually get to a lot of these houses, they now have a you know another streetcar, another tram. Uh huh. But it it literally goes through forest, oh. and the track and you 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 go down a narrow track <laughs> to the trees it's still still kind of the <laughs> edge <laughs> yeah it was a nice city I uh, I knew it quite well I, I once I got a bicycle I managed to get away on my own explore it so now cutting cutting further further into the future what you know in the 40s now what in, in the 1940s yeah you know how how do you get involved with trinity well Jones? i graduated from college in 42 and went to graduate school at harvard and met don on my very first day <laughs> we got married the following summer uh and by that, I had I got my master's that spring, and then went to work on a war project at, at Harvard. Um, which was on poison gas. And actually, I can't say I was poisoned, but I had some health effects that were worrisome. So I decided to quit, and uh, Don was working in Woods Hole by that time, um, where his PhD supervisor from Harvard was running a group. It was called Underwater Sound, but they were actually measuring air blasts, not underwater. <laughs> Other people were doing underwater. And um, so he was then asked to uh, uh, come to Los Alamos, and I was in the process actually. If I borrowed a lab, I was going to set up my experiments and finish my PhD, and so that was went down the drain at that point. Uh, and we went to Los Alamos in early May, I think, of uh, uh, forty-four. Mm. And when I got there, of course, Don went right to work, and uh, I had inquired before we went about wh what are the chances for me, and George Kistiakowski said, oh, no problem, we're scouring the country for people with masters in chemistry and other science fields. So I was fairly confident, but when I got there, I discovered that I was being sent to the personnel office, which normally dealt with, uh, you know, wives who could take dictation and type, none of which I could do. They asked me, I said, no, that's not what I do. But after a couple of days, they, uh, they did send me to the chemistry department. Uh, much to their surprise, because when they read my security questionnaire, 
the first reaction was, this is going to take months. <laughs> I had relatives in Argentina, some who had fled from Spain, uh, an aunt who was living in Ireland, all very suspicious goings on at the time. <laughs> And, uh, but it turned out, of course, my father had been so thoroughly vetted that <laughs> it was no problem for me. The, the thing that stopped them was I had been an officer of the American Student Union at Bryn Mawr, really radical place. You know? <laughs> um, but anyway, I got cleared within a couple of days and went to work in the chemistry division on uh, uh, in a group called Fundamental Wet Research, <laughs> which, which was uh, uh, determining chemical characteristics of plutonium, about which next to nothing was known. We have minute, uh, I mean, this was super micro scale for the time. There was, we used equipment that was specifically developed for uh, some of this work. Um, and of course, due to the radioactivity, you can trace minute amounts, uh, which isn't usually possible with ordinary chemicals. So I was fairly happy doing that. I was a little annoyed because my boss had exactly as much uh, training as I did. <laughs> but he was one of the California group who had... Uh, initially isolated plutonium. So he, he was quite knowledgeable. Um, but uh, I, the only other person I worked with was the only other woman in the, in the whole chemistry division who was a uh, you know, professional level, white badge, so-called. <laughs> and uh, after a couple of months, when the uh, uh, Hanford plant came online, the, uh, the uh, uh, 240 isotope of plutonium was, was found in the product, but had not showed up in the, um, uh, what do you call it? The machine that's originally made plutonium. Spin, it is, I'm missing the word. It's the thing that spins it, right? Um, was it that or Van de Graaff? Or, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, and Mary and I were fired overnight. <laughs> so she went home quite happily. She didn't really want to be working. And uh, and I went and got a job in the high explosives division, <laughs> uh, which was actually fascinating. I didn't think it was going to be, but we were working, our little group was working on uh, um, the shape of the lenses, high explosive lenses. And uh, the problem, of course, was to avoid getting jets. We wanted a perfectly spherical wave. And uh, the theory didn't really work out. Um, you know, we thought we knew why, but it was not easily quantifiable. So it was very much a uh, sort of um, duct tape and bailing wire kind of so. uh, process. And we did, just on empirical grounds, end up with uh, lenses that worked. And uh, so that, that was it. In, you know, as far as the, the project as a whole, you're talking about things that were very 
compartmentalized. Right? Very what? Very compartmentalized uh, as far as, um, you know, maybe you were working on something, somebody else was working. Oh, yes, they, but we had open communication. Did you? Okay. That was Oppenheimer had made that a condition with Groves, who didn't like that sort of approach. But we, all bike badge people could go to all meetings. Okay. And uh, one who came regularly to our little group meetings, section meetings, was Klaus Fuchs, the spy. <laughs> Took copious notes, was very helpful. He was, he was an excellent scientist. <laughs> He lived in Dresden, you know. What? He lived in Dresden for a while after he was released. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but as far as, like, we're talking about 1944, do, you know, is there, is there an antici anticipation of what you're creating? Um, yes. Um... I think it's safe to say that most of the people working on it thought of it in terms of the Germans. The Germans. And I don't think, uh, nobody ever talked about, you know, what would happen if you dropped this in the, in Europe. Um, do do I, you think it was intended for the Germans or do you think it was intended for the Japanese? I, this is pure speculation. Uh, I would think that it would not have been used actually in Germany. But we knew the Germans were working on one. And it would have been foolish not to. Um, but, but I think somehow the ultimate use was not very much in most people's minds at the time. It was a very goal-directed effort, you know, get the bomb to work. And I think people thought somehow all the issues would resolve themselves. <laughs> Nobody liked the idea of dropping it on anybody. Do, do you think you know, that's kind of actually what I was after. I mean, trying to think you have this, this grand project. And it's like, okay, is it, is it just a project, a science project, or is it reality? At that time, did you, did you think it would be question. reality? Or just a science project? Um, certainly, at the earlier time, for most of us, it was a science project. At what point did you say, hey, it's not a science project anymore, this, this could happen? Well, I think it was after the test. I mean, until the Trinity test, <laughs> there was a lot of reason to doubt that it would work. Although the, other, the uh, uranium bomb was, uh, it was, so widely assumed that it would work, which of course it did, uh, that nobody, it was not part of the conversation at, at Los Alamos that I remember. So, but what, what is your reaction when, when, they, when they do have success with the uranium? You're like, okay. when, when they have success with the uranium bomb, are you saying, ah, oh, you know, now it's, it looks like... Well, they didn't test it. Did it, yeah, but as far as... Uh, as far as like their, their progress, you know, is is like Get what? you know, as far as like their progress with with the uranium bombs, okay, they they made it happen, and okay, then you say okay, plutonium has a better chance of working. I mean, is it is was there a point in time where you say okay, this is going to work? In my innocence at age twenty three or whatever I was, uh, I certainly didn't consider the military mind. I think in retrospect there was no question that the military was going to find a way to use it. Um, there's just no way they could not yeah. from, from their perspective. 
was was with the end of the war approaching was there any thought of okay the war may end before this is done well the war wasn't ending <laughs> well you know the European, I, I think the, uh, I, I think lots of us would have felt better if we'd waited a few more days after Hiroshima but uh, again I, it's you know, the military were sitting there with this weapon. They wanted to know if they could drop it as well as detonate it on a tower. I really think that's part of it. And I signed a petition to, uh, um, you know, do a demonstration, which never went anywhere. Was, was most of the scientists in the same mind frame as you, as far as, mm -hmm. were most of the scientists in favor of doing something like that, or was it not really, you on a fringe? <laughs> you know, there wasn't that much conversation about it. Um, Don didn't sign it, he thought it was useless, which he was quite right about. Um, But, you know, the conclusion is uh, it's war that's wrong. It's not not the weapons you use. Well, what, what, was, what, was your, what was your reaction to Hiroshima when, when that bomb was successful? Was there a... Relief at the, at the obvious, obviously imminent end of the war. Did you, did you think that would have been the end? Or did you think, okay, three days later, we're dropping a plutonium? We hoped it would be the end. Were, were you surprised that they did they, they, they drop the plutonium bomb three days later? Or not? not really. I guess there's uh, some evidence now that the emperor wanted to end things before even Hiroshima, yeah. but certainly right after it. But the well, Japanese generals are just like ours. <laughs> but in, in your heart, did you say, you know, you know it, August 6th, you're hoping, okay, maybe it's over on the 7th and we don't have to go through it. You know, another one. Or at that point where you're just like, okay, it's going to happen no matter I what. Don't, we were away from Los Alamos. Mm. And so it's, it's hard for me because we were with Don's family. His brother was in the Navy and was supposed to be going overseas uh, any minute. And they had practically forced us to come home to see him. And we knew damn well he wouldn't be going. But uh, anyway, we had to go. But there was nobody to talk about it, except the two of us. <laughs> and <coughs> uh, I think it gave us some insight into how much of the public would, uh, would respond, which was just, hooray, the war's going to be over. Um, Don's parents were not well educated, and uh, you know they weren't thinking about this in any larger terms. They they weren't interested in the fact that this was a fantastic technical feat. Do Do you remember see, like when was the first time you saw the picture of? of of Nagasaki on August 9th? Newspaper. Well, I have to say I wasn't surprised because I had seen the uh, test shot and uh, it was quite obvious that you know, there would be huge destruction. It was breathtaking.
it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, in, in the museums, um, there are some photos taken by people on the ground, you know, far further away uh-huh. that I had never seen before because you, we, don't, we always see the overhead shot, you know, uh-huh. of it, you know, from the airplane. But there were, you know, prints of, of you know, people who were miles away just taking a snap and it I think it looks it looks so much bigger when you when you're looking from the ground up then huh. and uh, I, I never really said that they those existed well I, I was over a hundred miles away from the one I watched and uh, it was very impressive just the same an incredible sight But uh, after the ninth, sorry. After after August ninth, after Nagasaki, yeah. after the bomb is dropped on Nagasaki. And, well, did, I, I'm not sure if, if did you did you say okay that 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 will end it, you know, a week later, or did you say okay there, there's going to be more of this in the coming weeks or months? There wasn't any more. Yeah. <laughs> no, we knew there would not be a third. Okay. It was a sense of relief. Hmm? A sense of relief that the, the Japanese surrender on the 15th. Sure. Hmm. You know, the predictions have been that we had to attempt a landing in mainland Japan, it would be 100,000 hmm. casualties right there. Hmm. At, at that time, did you, did you kind of, I mean, the interesting part about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to me, it, it's, it, it's kind of like that, that time stamp where, where the world changed, mm-hmm. you know, it, we, we entered a nuclear, a nuclear war, mm-hmm. uh, world, I mean, did you realize that at that point, it's like, okay, the, you know, the ground game for war has changed. You know, wars are going to be fought this way. Um, well, I think we hope to win. <laughs> um, we favored sharing it with the world, which you know, it didn't matter whether we did or not, it was already shared. Um, but it's. Uh, The idea is not not complicated. The execution takes a little know-how. Um, I didn't even know about the super bomb. I don't know whether Don did or not. Super bomb is the was a hydrogen bomb. Hydrogen bomb. Hmm. I don't know what. They call tactical weapons. Do you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, I see references to those, but uh, I can't imagine what they are. And it was did did you continue working? On, did I? What? Did you continue working after this on on these on the hydrogen bomb? Or? I uh, actually I I caught. Hepatitis mm. from the only raw oyster I've eaten in my entire life. <laughs> so I spent some time being sick. Uh, but then I, yeah, I went back to work actually in the same group Don was in. Um, basically um, shuffling papers. Yeah. Um, the work of that unit was being transferred to Sandia and so you know we went through reams of papers. I spent a lot of time out in the hot sun in the backyard of the lab with a pot-bellied stove <laughs> feeding papers. <laughs> <laughs> but feeding papers reminds me of one of my jobs on the uh, uh, Lens group 
um, was to take new designs to the machine shop and give them to David Greenglass, who was Ethel Rosenberg's brother and the you know source of much of the wisdom. <laughs> Were you, were, you, were you surprised when, when like I was absolutely stunned when, when that business came out I had no idea what I not I would say I was not all that surprised about Fuchs he was a, a weird guy <laughs> uh, we knew him a little bit because uh, uh, we had an, an old 1937 Ford coupe that before we ever got it, somebody had knocked out the partition between the seating compartment and the trunk. So there was a clear six foot space in there. And we ended up being the uh, ambulance for the ski slope. <laughs> and Klaus got, I uh, forget what it was, broken leg or something. Uh, so they strapped him up on skis for a stretcher and shoved him in my trunk and I took him to the hospital. And then he, after he got, had a cast put on, he came to dinner. Um, and I, you know, I assumed that uh, with the German background we would have some things in common, things to talk about. And he was, I, I just could not uh, get him to, you know, open up at all. He played some chess with Don, I remember. Um, but I don't think they talked very much. And, and, and he came to our, we had weekly section meetings for telling each other what we had accomplished. And he came, always came to those, almost, I would say, 90% of the time. So I felt I knew him, but I didn't know anything about him. And I, I remember dancing with him at some party or other uh, and trying to make conversation, uh, asking him about where in Germany he was from, that sort of thing. And he just was very reluctant to say anything. And, of course, you probably know that both the FBI and the British Intelligence Service were quite aware of his communist background. And why they allowed him in, I have no idea. <laughs> but I think his boss wanted him very badly. Piles was another refugee uh, working in at Birmingham. He was at Birmingham. And he wanted him. Well, Oppenheimer was very close with him also. Hmm? Oppenheimer was very close with Fuchs also. Was very what? Was very close with him? Uh, with Mr. Was Fuchs? Fuchs? Yeah. No, oh. I don't think. Not that I know of. Okay. It's, uh... <laughs> I, you know, it's hard to know. I mean, Oppenheimer was obviously a, a complicated case himself. His wife was an alcoholic. And no asset to him. She's a very uh, lively person and, you know, busy everywhere. Um, but uh, given his position and the demands of the work, I didn't have the impression that he had any close pals. Yeah. I may be quite wrong. <laughs> Klaus Fuchs gets gets exposed as a spy. Sorry. When when Klaus Fuchs gets exposed by as a as a spy. Mm -hmm. um, is this before the Russians successfully tested the H bomb or after? I think it was before, but not much. I have a feeling it was in, in January nineteen fifty two. The reason I have a 
fairly clear memory of I had gotten away from the, my darling little children for the first time in years and years, first time ever. Um, Don was going to an American Chemical Society meeting in New York, mm. and I went with him there, and we unfolded the paper at breakfast, and there it was. Did you think of did Did you think of Mr. Fuchs when you saw that news? Or? Well, it, it said, okay. yeah, sure. Yeah. Have you ever, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are the only two times where it was used in warfare, the bomb. Did you, was there any point in time where you said it's going to be used again? It can be used again? Yeah. yeah. Fear, you know, fear that it would be. I certainly could not envision at that point a situation where it would be used again. Hopefully. <laughs> Hope so. It's, uh, and, uh, you know, and that's more than you can say of most other weapons. <laughs> and there's so many nations who have it now. Yeah. Like you said, the technology is not, no, not out there. You just have to hope ISIS doesn't get it. <laughs> scary enough with the Indians and Pakistanis. <laughs> yeah, that is very scary. The North Koreans. Pakistan bears a lot of the responsibility for that. And of course, in North Korea. <laughs> Do, do, do you think that the, the, the nuclear nations have been responsible with their technology? I mean, we're talking, I don't mean, you know, as far as the nuclear, the, the nations who have nuclear weapons, they, have, they haven't used them, but do no. you think, it have, have, have they acted responsibly with the technology? Well, yes, I think so. But it's it's worrisome, always. Always going to be somewhere the possibility of a trigger happy guy, yeah. and it won't be a woman. <laughs> have, have you have you ever thought of um, have you ever thought of the people in Hiroshima or Nagasaki? You know when it happened to you yourself. You obviously, you knew what the technology can do, and you were saying, oh, you know, is it something that you ever think about or had done? Well, I, I've thought about them a lot, but I don't know enough to, you know, to think in a useful way, really. I mean, I, I don't know how people put their lives together again after uh, any kind of disaster like that. that. That's kind of what was my curiosity yeah. about going to a place like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. You know, how does one pick up the pieces? And um, Well, have you thought about talking to people who survive other kinds of disasters. I mean, what about things like major floods or, or major fires? Yeah. Well, Tokyo was a fire case, but... Yeah. Yeah. That's something that has, has a component of, I think you say, you know, it's... Or a tsunami, like yeah. Indonesia. Yeah. You know, to me, it's interesting, like you said before, maybe not the weapons, it's war itself. You know, it's yeah. it's two sides agitating each other and doing you know doing things to one yeah. another. You know, it's a human aspect to me. You know, it's one thing to talk about nature. You know, <laughs> you say, oh, I yeah, just don't. You know, just, we just don't have any luck. Well, there's <laughs> nobody you can blame. In yeah, this sense. exactly. But you know, people try and uh, whatever it is, Fukushima. Um, there's plenty of blame to go around. 
that would be, they couldn't help the tsunami, but the uh, radiation problem is a man-made problem. Have you ever visited Japan? Yes, one, well, been through a, an airport other times, but okay. yeah, I spent um, 10 days, two weeks, back in the six, mid-60s. Just Tokyo area? Tokyo, um, Kyoto, Osaka, and Nara. Nara was nice. I, I, it's, it's funny, uh, on, my, on my way to, from Hiroshima to Nagasaki, you know, you pass through Kukura. which was, what? Uh, Kukura, which was yeah. the, the fir- really the first target to the Nagasaki bomb, was uh-huh. supposed to be Kukura. And it was, you know, you, you thought about, like, okay, you know, how you know, they didn't drop the bomb on it because it was too cloudy, you know, on Kukura. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, the fates of, of two cities completely different mm-hmm. it's just really a strange feeling you know mm-hmm. um, so it's done. It's a, I had a funny experience in Japan the embassy had a reception in honor of Don's visit and hundreds of people showed up far more than they expected <laughs> and it turned out they thought they were going to see his cousin Jim Morning who had spent a year in Japan and made many, many friends as he did everywhere he went. (laughs) (laughs) But the trip to Nara was uh, one of the embassy people had a house, a Japanese house on the temple grounds and arranged for us to spend the weekend there. And it was just you know, fabulous. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a beautiful country, you know. It's 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 yeah. it's got two different sides to it. It's got this modern side to it, and it's there wasn't much modern then. They, they were still barely recovering from the war, and this was you know ten years later. But, you know, t- today it's interesting. It, it, it's you look. You have to really look for those traditional things. They're hard to find. Uh, I'm sure they are now. Yeah. Yeah, and it's I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like my my whole when I go there. I'm very. Um, you know, the, the search the search is so difficult. <laughs> you know, when when you find it, you you know you really cherish it. You know, this was pretty special. We, you know, we just wandered around the temple grounds on our own, paths through the woods. It was lovely. <laughs>